Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jim McCall with DMAI. Uh, a couple housekeeping notes before we get started. We will be recording today's webinar, uh, so you don't need to worry about jotting down notes or anything like that. Uh, we will email out a copy of the recording along with a copy of the presentation slides about four business days from today. We will also be accepting questions throughout the presentation. So if you use the questions panel on your GoTo uh, dashboard, you can submit questions throughout the presentation. I will be monitoring those questions and feeding them over to our panelists at the end of the presentation. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Timothy Schneider. Timothy Schneider is the president and CEO of Los Angeles-based Schneider Publishing Company, which publishes two magazines serving group travel markets, Sports Travel and Association News. His company also organizes the Teams Conference and Expo, the world's largest gathering of sports event organizers, and Meeting <coughs> Quest, the nation's longest running series of trade shows for associations and corporate meeting planners. He's a passionate advocate of the travel and sports industry. He's also the founder of, sports, uh, founder of the Sports Travel Foundation, a past chairman of the Destination and Travel Foundation, and a two-term two board member of the National Association of Sports Commissions. He's also served on the boards of DMAI and the U.S. Travel Association. Please welcome Tim Schneider. Thank you very much, Jim. Hello, everyone. We really, really appreciate this opportunity to share our enthusiasm for the sports market with the members of DMAI. I'm very pleased to welcome Jim Wood, the Chief Executive Officer of Meet AC, as my fellow presenter for this webinar. Jim is doing nothing less than transforming Atlantic City from one of the nation's best-known gaming cities to a destination that is fast becoming a mecca for meetings, conventions, and sporting events. Welcome, Jim Wood. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here, and, and uh, thank everybody for being on this uh, call today with us. In today's webinar, we're going to be talking about the power of sports to drive overnight stays in cities large and small. In the first part of the webinar, I will be discussing the unique attributes of sporting events, drilling into the various levels of a single sport, and taking a look at a case study around a single event. I'll also look at the latest trends in sporting events and sports-related travel. Jim will be providing insights on how to know whether sporting events are a good fit for your destination, and how your destination can position itself as being sports friendly. He will also be sharing his experience around founding the Six City Sports Commission and suggesting best practices for making sure your destination can attract a greater share of the business that this market segment produces. So let's get to it and let me start by asserting an audacious claim. And that is when it comes to generating travel, there is no power greater than sports. Put simply, sports and sporting events provide an emotional component that other forms of travel lack. Sports and sporting events bind generation to generation, fathers and mothers to their sons and daughters, unlike any other factor that causes people to travel. Let me illustrate this, if, if I might, using a personal example. Every year in, in the small town where I live in Southern California, there is a 5K run on the 4th of July. And ever since I moved to the town, I participate in this run with my two sons. Luke is the older son, Jack uh, the younger, and of course there's Lucky the super dog who oftentimes participates in the 5K with us. But this is something that we've done every year since I've lived in my hometown. And as are most of the things that are important to me, they somehow end up in the garage. But you'll notice on one wall of the garage is the bib and a photo from each year that we've participated in this 5K. I show you this as an illustration of the kind of emotional pull that a sporting event can have attached to it. And whether a person relates to sports through a participatory event, relates to sports because they once participated in a particular sport, or relates to sports simply as a fan of a team, whether it's a professional level team, a collegiate level team, or even a high school level team, those factors contribute to making sports 
the most powerful component to generating travel for the travel industry. And so I would like to spend a little time just talking about that kind of power, the power that sports has to move people. According to research from our research partner, Longwoods International, sports is a phenomenon that causes people to travel regardless of what's going on in the world, regardless of the state of the economy. According to Longwoods, 73.5 million adults traveled 100, mil, uh, excuse me, 100 miles or more round trip to attend an organized sporting event in the past five years. The sports-related travel market not only generates in excess of $200 billion in travel spending, it generates 97.7 million room nights annually, according to Longwoods International. This data is important to keep in mind and something that we all need to uh, be aware of as we're discussing the importance of sports-related travel in our own communities. And every year since we've published Sports Travel Magazine, which we launched in 1997, someone will approach me and ask, well, the sports market has got to stop growing at some point. There's no way it can continue to grow. And people have said this to me, as I say, every year since about 1997. So in each one of these presentations that we do, we like to take a look at some of the most recent events and how they've fared. For example, in 2014, the 655 NCAA football programs drew record attendance, 49 million fans. In 2015, the Major League Baseball All-Star Game garnered a record 731 million combined votes from fans. The game itself and the Home Run Derby watched by a record number, 9.28 million people, largest audience since 2010. In the NBA, spending on sponsorship and the 30, 30 teams in the NBA has hit all-time highs. And just this uh, uh, past February, a record 167 million people in the U.S. watched Super Bowl 50. An estimated 1.1 million people visited Super Bowl City in San Francisco the week before the game. That's a record for that fan festival and also points out the power of sports to move people even if they don't have a ticket to the event. They still want to be in and around that sporting activity and they take the trip to the city or area that's hosting the sporting event even though they don't have a ticket to go to the event itself. The FIFA Women's World Cup, which was staged in Canada last summer, is another example of the growth of sports, in this case, women's sports. And this is an event much in the news today because the U.S. women's soccer team has filed a claim uh, asking for equal pay based on the fact at least in part, of the popularity of this event last summer in Canada. And you can see the data points here. Total attendance of over 1.3 million, a great average attendance, a new total attendance record for a FIFA competition other than the FIFA World Cup. So the growth of sports, the continued strength of this market is indisputable, and we see evidence of it everywhere we turn. I do want to spend a few moments talking about the unique attributes of sports-related travel. And these are important things to keep in mind because a big part of what we do with Sports Travel Magazine and the Teams Conference is to sort of address the ideas and conceptions that people might have when they enter this market. And it's important to know the full picture of the sports-related travel market. And so one of the important things we always point out is that while the conception is, well, we need a sports-specific venue in order to attract sporting events, the fact of the matter is a lot of events can be staged in hotel ballrooms, in your convention center, in high school and college facilities, even in public places, in parks, on roadways. So it's not always absolutely necessary that you have a sports-specific venue in order to book more business from the sports market. It's also very important to keep in mind that there are more than 100 different sports that hold championship events and tournaments. That's important because a lot of the focus, particularly in the mainstream media, 
is on the big popular sports that everyone's familiar with, baseball, football, basketball, hockey. But there are more than 100 other sports that should be uh, kept in mind as you're positioning your destination uh, to attract more of this business. It's also important to realize that sports event organizers, more than other types of event planners, value long-term destination and hotel relationships. You may ask, why is that? Well, a lot of the people who end up being responsible for planning sporting events come out of the sports world themselves. They do not come from a meeting and event planning background necessarily, and so they look to the destination where they're staging an event or the hotel that they're using as their official hotel. They look to those entities to help them in the planning process. And this is absolutely vital for convention bureaus to realize because the needs of sports event organizers are slightly different than those of other meeting and event planners. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. One of the other outstanding attributes of sports-related travel is that the events themselves are highly visible, which means their impact is more easily witnessed and measured. And they also have this attribute that they enhance the quality of life for residents of the host city. Contrast that to other types of group business that your destination may book. It's not very often that you'll have a lot of locals who want to go attend a dentist convention or a meeting of the Bar Association. But if there is a sporting event coming to town, chances are good the organizer of that event wants local support, wants people turning out from your city. And it also gives your residents an additional entertainment option uh, for them to consider. So that is an important attribute of the sports-related travel market. We're also very uh, uh, fond of pointing out that sports-related travel is indeed family travel. And for this slide, we're looking at some data provided by Hilton Worldwide's Embassy Suites Hotels, who did an extensive study of the, the fact that a lot of sports-related travel involves families. We know from other research that the younger a participant in a sporting event is, the larger the travel party size will be. And that's simply because not only will mom and dad usually go if the participant is young, but brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, grandma and grandpa, they may all go to that event that the uh, youngster is participating in. In this study from Embassy Suites Hotels, 93% of the parents surveyed said they have delayed or skipped buying something for themselves to pay for their child's sports travel. So stop and think about the priority that a parent will place on the fact that one of their children has qualified for a sporting event requiring them to travel. Do you think that becomes the number one priority for that family? Absolutely it does, and this study uh, put the numbers on it. 92% of those in this survey said they were willing to forego any number of activities in order to facilitate their child's involvement in, in sports-related travel. And what we've seen time and time again, particularly in times when there are economic troubles and the economy is tight, that sports-related trip will become the family vacation. And the family will go to that sports event as their vacation, but it's being driven by the sports participation of one of the family members. And as you can see on the final bullet point here, 64% um, of the respondents to this survey said they'd taken time off from work to accommodate their child's sports team travel schedule. Well, there's a lot of talk in our industry and a move by the U.S. Travel Association to make sure people are taking their vacation time. It looks to me from this study that sports-related travel is one of the keys to making sure people take the time they have coming to them. And in fact, from this study we learn that they're more likely to do that around their child's sports-related travel uh, than perhaps doing it just to take a day off. Now, one of the uh, sort of misconceptions that we oftentimes hear about the sports-related travel market is the fact that, well, it is family travel, and so it's economy travel, and they want to sleep six people to a room, 
and it's not a great market from the standpoint of upscale or luxury travel. So to confront that misconception, I turned to a brand new study, the U.S. Luxury Travel Report, which was just recent, recently issued. And it found that travelers in the top 5% of household income and net worth rank sports and fitness activities as their number one vacation pastime. It found further that participating in outdoor sports, which can mean being a spectator at a live sport event, sporting event or participating in a once-in-a-lifetime activity or some other athletic competition, all finished among the top seven vacation activities for luxury travelers. So if you approach this market thinking, oh, it's only a, a, you know economy hotels involved and not a market that can produce big spenders, stop and think about these data points. Because if you can figure out a way to combine a number of these things, like being a spectator at a live sports event and participating in a once-in-a-lifetime activity, that can be very attractive uh, to luxury travelers. As I mentioned earlier, there are more than 100 different sports that organize championships and tournaments. And as I said, it's very important to remain open to all of those different sports because all of those different sports not only organize activities, they do so on a number of levels, by which I mean oftentimes at the youth and amateur level, at the collegiate level, and also at the professional level. And so in the next part of the webinar here, I want to talk a little bit about one sport in particular. It's one everyone is familiar with, and that's baseball. And if you start and take a look at baseball, of course, the first thing you think about are the professional teams. Whether or not you have a professional team in your city, it's not unusual for every city in the country to feel, uh, feel an affiliation with a particular professional team. But it's important also to keep in mind that Major League Baseball is more than the regular season. It's spring training, which obviously has a huge impact on destinations in Arizona and Florida. It is the all-star game itself which, as I said earlier, and we'll look at some more data points here in a little bit about the social media aspect of sports, but that event has become a week-long event, usually involving a convention center and several activities at the ballpark. Of course, there's the playoffs, the World Series. All of those things are things we're all very familiar with, but you should also keep in mind the meetings and conventions held around Major League Baseball, which includes general manager meetings, the winter meetings where all of the teams come together, the owner meetings, which involve not only the owners of the professional clubs, but the minor league clubs. It's very important that all of those activities be kept in mind when you're thinking about the sport of baseball. Of course, baseball is a sport that extends into the collegiate realm as well. And while everyone is very familiar with NCAA baseball and the Baseball World Series, it's important to know that there's more to the collegiate market than the NCAA, though that's by far the largest uh, association for collegiate athletics. There are several other associations out there, the NAIA, the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, the NJCAA, the National Junior College Athletic Association, the USCAA, the United States Collegiate Athletic Association, the NCCAA, the National Christian College Athletic Association, all of these organizations involved in sanctioning competitive events that cause teams to travel. And of course, as I said, there's also the amateur and youth level of baseball. And immediately when I say youth baseball, people think of Little League. But look at all of the other organizations that sanction amateur and youth baseball events. Uh, my own son, the younger one, Jack, is playing Pony League baseball. And uh, I'm happy to report that it's my understanding in Pony League, everyone makes it to the playoffs because Jack's, uh, uh, Jack's team has not been doing so well this season, but he still will have that experience of playing in the playoffs for the Pony League. But it's important to find out which of these leagues are active in your city. What can you do to connect with these organizations in a way that would make it more likely for you to be able to host any events they might organize 
that would bring players and fans in from out of town. So that's the examination of the many levels of a sport with which we're all familiar. I also wanted to take a look very briefly at a case study that was completed by the University of Utah and was provided to us by the Utah Sports Commission on just one event that the Utah Sports Commission hosts. And this is the Monster Energy Supercross stop. The Super, Monster Energy Supercross is a series of events. And so the same things that you'll see revealed by this study occur in cities all over the country. In the case of this event, uh, this one's held in Salt Lake City at Rice Eccles Stadium. And if you take a look at the impact of this event in and around the stadium, you'll see where revenue begins to flow as a result of the destination hosting this event. Obvious things like renting the facility and other facility fees, there's ticket revenue, temporary jobs that are created, the food and beverage that's sold, and of course parking. All of that is create economic impact around this event. Of course, for an event like a Supercross series, you're going to need to bring in dirt, in this case, 500 loads of dirt. Other capital improvements to the venue may be necessary, and oftentimes those will result in business for local contractors and vendors. Of course, there's electric, AV, and utilities, all of the graphics that goes into the event, oftentimes customized to each stop of the event. Outside the stadium, there are even other event expenses, including the lodging for the teams, the maintenance of the vehicles used by the competitors, food and entertainment for not only the fans and spectators, but the people who are participating. And of course, they require a lot of rental cars, not to mention fuel for 80 big rig trucks. So it's important when you're thinking about an event to keep in mind all of these various areas where spending occurs. In this particular instance, this event has an attendance of almost 40,000, and their study revealed that 20 to 25 percent of them came from outside of the state of Utah. So that's a pretty long trip into Salt Lake City, which means they're going to spend uh, a night or two in local hotels. And of course, there is the, the team themselves that need to be housed, uh, more than 20 teams with between 5 and 25 support people per team, a total of 75 riders. And along with that, national and international sponsors who travel to the event. And here again, if it's a corporate sponsor of a sporting event, they're likely to look for a four or five star hotel experience. So again, another area where uh, uh, higher dollars are spent in terms of accommodations around the sponsors who travel. There are, of course, benefits in terms of hosting an event like this, uh, this particular one is broadcast on network television. And as part of the hosting agreement, the Utah Sports Commission received three 30-second units of advertising time during that broadcast. And then after it was broadcast on network television, it was rebroadcast multiple times on cable television. And in addition to the national marketing that occurs around the event, there's also a bump in terms of the local marketing that occurs because they advertise to sell tickets. So all in all, there was a great deal of media value created around this single event, estimated by this University of Utah study, of $3 million in media, <coughs> estimated $9 million in direct economic impact for the destination. And that's one event, one event. <laughs> I did want to spend a, a few minutes talking about the trends in sports and which sports are growing. This data comes to us from the Sports and Fitness Industry Association, formerly Association. And as you can see, the number one uh, sport in terms of growth is, has been stand-up paddleboarding, uh, which is a sport that not everyone would immediately think of. What you see is a syndrome in sports where if it becomes popular from a participation standpoint, there will then result in events being organized around it. So we are seeing growth in the number of stand-up paddle boarding competitions. And while you may not see your destination as one that is necessarily friendly to stand-up paddle boarding, you should take another look at that because all you really need 
is a steel body of water in order to host a paddleboarding event. I'm happy to say that Luke and Jack, and now you get to meet their mother, uh, Laura, were early adopters of the uh, paddleboarding craze, and we've seen more and more uh, people getting involved in paddleboarding up to the point at which uh, even I would ask, have we reached a peak? Perhaps a sign of that would be a recent cover from the Knights of Columbus magazine showing how very accessible paddleboarding as a sport can be. We have seen continued growth in participatory events, particularly among women. And this is data provided to us by Running USA, which is the trade organization for marathons and other running events. And what it shows is, is very interesting. First, it's record levels of participation. But you'll notice that it's almost a 60-40 uh, division here in terms of the popularity of running events from the standpoint of the number of people who have finished. Uh, in the most recent year for which data is available, which is 2014, uh, 11 million women finished running events, and just about 8.5 million men finished running events. So, uh, but the important thing here, I think, is to look at the growth over time and how the popularity of those events continues. Certainly, if you're talking about participatory events, what you're seeing is a result, I think, of the age wave where events are growing when they're fun to do and when they can be family activities. Interesting from Running USA that Halloween is now the second most popular running holiday. Thanksgiving is the most popular running holiday. Uh, 1,800 Halloween runs held in the most recent year for which data is available, which is 2014. And no, that is not me dressed as a piece of bacon. But you can see people are having fun with it. We've seen this huge growth in things like fun runs, color runs, because there are very few age restrictions. It's a relaxed atmosphere, and it's meant to be fun. But because there has been so much growth in the number of these runs, I would caution destinations to be careful about who you're partnering with for a fun run in your city, because due to the proliferation of the events, some of them have been canceled and others are, have, have struggled uh, and have had to be canceled. I can tell you these color runs in particular will be a smash hit with your local hotel community and the housekeeping staff. Now I mentioned earlier the connection between sports and digital media and I just wanted to spend a minute on the fact that there has been tremendous growth in the traction that sporting events receive in the digital realm. And again, we'll return to Major League Baseball because this is a well-established sport, but they have done an amazing job of making their sport one that people can connect with through digital and social media. So you see several of the data points here in terms of the record downloads they've had for their app. They're now uh, offering an Apple Watch and are able to measure how many glances that app at baseball games. 26 million glasses during the 25th season. So there's tremendous traction occurring, and sports is, again, a powerful force when it comes to social media. I also wanted to briefly touch on sports and the sharing economy. There's been a lot of discussion, of course, in our industry about Airbnb, and the opinion kind of ranges all the way from they're involved in an illegal activity to it's the wave of the future and we need to collect hotel taxes from them. But the interesting thing about Airbnb and the other uh, providers in the sharing economy is it can allow a destination to redefine what events they might be able to host. And the reason it can do that is depending on how you count the units that are available through Airbnb and similar sites, that can more than double the inventory of a particular city in terms of being able to host large events, large-scale events. And people in the sports market are particularly uh, more inclined to do a homestay than many other types of markets. So markets, I would suggest that destinations remain open to how they might be able to leverage the growth and the popularity 
of the sharing economy as a way to attract additional business for their destinations. And since I'm speaking to you from Los Angeles, I have to bring you one final trend. Uh, the newest event that we've seen lately is something called the 420 Games. Yes, it's a, a, a sporting event where you won't have to worry about passing a drug test because the event is dedicated, as this promotional item says, to destigmatizing millions of responsible, positive cannabis users through athletic achievement. So uh, it, it, this illustrates the incredible variety of sports and the fact that in the time that we've been in this market, the number of new events that are, uh, have gotten created is just astounding. And it's something that continues nonstop because it's only limited by the creativity of the event organizer involved and the destinations that they work with because those types of partnerships can lead to new and very unexpected events. That note, it's now my great pleasure to again introduce you to Jim Wood, the CEO of Meet AC. Jim is a destination marketing veteran having previously served as the president and CEO of the Providence, Rhode Island and Louisville, Kentucky CDBs. Since taking the top job at Meet AC less than two years ago, he's taken on the task of repositioning Atlantic City as a dynamic and diverse destination for meetings, conventions, and sporting events. Jim, tell us about the work you're doing in Atlantic City and why one of your first moves in your destination was to form a sports commission. Good. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Meet AC was formed in 2014 as a 501c6 uh, not-for-profit organization. And we went ahead uh, in January of, of, of the following year, 2015, we formed the Atlantic City Sports Commission as a 501c3. There were several different uh, models in which to choose from. Uh, there's, there's terrific models. Everything just depends upon your particular destination, what works best. And for us, to have the Sports Commission as a department within Meet AC made the most sense based on uh, a lot of local factors where we use the same board of directors for both organizations, so there's continuity there. And their budget is embedded within our budget, and our, the funding comes to us through uh, the luxury tax here in Atlantic City, which most of you would know as room tax, but for us it also includes tax on ticket sales and a restaurant tax. So in a nutshell, we went with this direction, uh, this model for now, and, uh, and, and it may morph into something a little bit uh, greater in the future, but for now it works for us. One of the things we hear from event organizers all of the time is a sort of confusion in cities where there is both a convention bureau and a sports commission as far as which entity should they be dealing with. I would presume the way you've set it up results in less confusion when those types of questions come up. It is, and I spoke with Don Schumacher with the National Association of Sports Commissions, and I asked Don what model was preferable, at least to start with, and, and the model that he recommended was for the Sports Commission to be a department within the CVB for that reason. Um, there's more resources to draw from from CVBs and things like that. Now, there are successful models that are not uh, part of the CVB, and, and they work terrific in their communities. You know. So for those cities that work or for those state uh, tourism uh, or sports commissions, they're doing a great job. But at least from a starting standpoint, uh, it made sense for us. I think the majority of the sports commissions are departments within CVBs. That's what Don had told me. And so knowing that most everybody out there has used that model, we felt let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's go ahead and do with what most everybody is following right now. What I'm hoping you'll talk a little bit about for uh, the participants in the webinar, Jim, is how to determine if an event is right for your destination. And uh, if you would, please take it away on the five Fs of, of booking and hosting sporting events. Yeah, this first part is really designed for the destination, uh, for the destination marketers, for uh, sports commission uh, individuals, anybody in sales. Uh, really the five Fs of booking and hosting the sporting events we see fit, forthright, foreseeability, uh, forecaster and flexibility. So let's talk about fit first. Uh, number one fit, does it make sense <clears throat> for my city or for my venues uh, for my local ticket buying market? So the big question is whenever you go after an event, sometimes our, our appetite is, is big, but our facilities can't quite accommodate it. So we have to be careful 
about to make sure that you know our our venues work for a particular client. And then do I have local members who will support the event? As an example, if you want to host an archery tournament, you may need a local archery club to be there. And a lot of times we will all see that in our RFPs, that uh, they will ask for local members to help support the event and be there because they need their resources and their intellectual properties. So as you're building your databases, find out who all the local sports clubs are within your community. Keep them in your database. And so as you're soliciting those events, you've got somebody there willing to step up and who can help you. And then having the infrastructure, allowing for the participants to move around. Just you, You've got to be able to match up what infrastructure you have to those events. If you don't have the infrastructure, move on to those events that you do have. Uh, don't waste the client's time. So that's really the area for fit. Now let's get into number two, forthright. Can, uh, can your community really support it? And, and you really have to have a gut check with some events. Can, as an example for us here in Atlantic City, can we support a sand and beach soccer tournament in the middle of the beach season? It's a question we have to ask ourselves. Do we want that during peak season? They want to have that event during peak season, but do we need it on our beach? Are our facilities up to the necessary standards? Uh, you may have state-of-the-art facilities, or you may have older venues. Um, and sometimes the older venues are more affordable, and sometimes they work terrific. Uh, and sometimes um, clients may want more of a state-of-the-art uh, venue. Do you have everything that you say you have? Sometimes let's not. Well, we we always have to be careful about over-promising and under-delivering, and that's what that's all about. Uh, and and you know, at the gut check time is when the client comes into town and say you promised X, Y, but you, all you can deliver is Z. And so again, making sure that you. Uh, do not overpromise and underdeliver. And an event organizer will start figuring it out right away if you don't. And they do. They're smart. They're savvy. They've worked with many cities. A lot of you on the phone, they've worked with you. Uh, and so they know exactly uh, what they need, and they know how to get it if uh, you can't accommodate it. You have foreseeability. Uh, foreseeability. Uh, what can go wrong? You know, obviously, we have to troubleshoot. But let's, uh, when we're ever hosting an event, you know, we want to make sure that we've got all of our I's and T's dotted and crossed, especially when it comes to the need of safety and security and things like that. Um, what are the legal requirements, safety issues, and other areas? I just touched on safety, but again, it is making sure that you've got your police engaged, your fire engaged, your EMTs engaged if you need to when you're hosting events. Uh, sometimes in your municipality, you've got to have an insurance policy in place uh, that just protects the city, it protects the venue, and it protects the participants. And then risk management strategies. Make sure that you have those in place when you're hosting the event. And uh, forecaster. Is your weather conducive to hosting this event? Um, we ask ourselves those questions. When, when we receive RFPs, you know, we have a certain seasonality here on the Atlantic seaboard. And to make sure that the weather is right, there, there's great seasons, there's shoulder seasons, and there's tough seasons. And of course, a lot of our partners would like us to move business into those uh, less than appealing uh, seasons, uh, but we really have to be champions for that event to make sure that it is in the right weather climate for the event. Uh, what do you do in the case of inclement weather? Obviously, you got to have make sure that you got to have the right weather uh, or or fallback plans, especially if it's an outdoor event. Then we get into flexibility. Uh, know that know that even if all the F's are addressed, things will happen, and you must be able to adjust on the fly. And we all know that. I, I think everybody's savvy enough when uh, selling their cities and marketing their destinations to make sure that you got um, the right kind of uh, flexibility with the client and the participants understand that. So I think we all work well and understand the flexibility needs. Now we want to move on to the next piece of this. And Tim, if you want to advance that, we want to talk about uh, the event organizers top 10 list. And these are important to the organizers. We start with uh, a big one, funding. Uh, you know that when the RFPs come out, there's always a bid fee associated with some of them. So financial support for the event is important because they need those dollars to help make the event work. Uh, they do look for grants and obviously hotel rebates. Uh, they want reduced site fees and access to sponsors, which is one that everybody asks for. And, and so if you've got that sports commission or that organization, if you've got companies interested, ask those companies in advance what sporting events would you like to be a sponsor with if we're able to get it? Know who they are, and that way when that time comes and you've got somebody in mind, you can make the connection. Um, again, attention, public relations, media relations, uh, making sure that you've got uh, the right kind of horsepower 
uh, that you can help support the event organizer with. They want to they want to get out on the radio shows and things like that. And we've hooked up uh, some event organizers here in Atlantic City on ESPN Radio, a local affiliate. That's a no-brainer, obviously, for any of your sports markets. So make sure that you're able to do that. Support from municipal agencies very critical for all of us uh, to make sure that there's ample co cooperation. Yeah, that's when when you meet with the city, if there's a department for permitting and things like that, that you've got that relationship with them. And sometimes, let me give you everybody, everybody some advice. When you sometimes have a department that is not that cooperative or an individual, bring the client to them. And you'll be amazed on how quickly a no or a no can get turned to yes when you do that. Uh, spectator and participant base, uh, certainly they want to be able to sell tickets, merchandising, uh, right space for uh, athlete registrations. And so then we get to number six, and that's your community. You want to make sure the community is uh, enthusiastic. There are some events that just really turn on your local community, like the Ironman, triathlons, uh, certain road races, uh, marathons. They really jazz the community. People like that. They want to volunteer for it because they're, you know, color runs. People love doing that, whether they're throwing the color at the people or participating, as, as Tim shared with us earlier. Uh, community support is very, very important, and then volunteer support. Maintain a volunteer base. A lot of you do that. If you don't, start growing a volunteer base and find those people who have that leadership quality that say, hey, I can bring 10 people with them. Great. You can bring 10. You're now a coordinator. And so identify those individuals uh, that can be uh, helpful for volunteers. Transportation. Um, this one is, is an inter interesting one. For some cities, it's very easy. For some cities, it's more challenging. Obviously, to and, event, uh, to and from the event and hotel really depends on the RFP and, and uh, the client. Uh, and then airport pickup to and from. A lot of us have shuttle services, so that's a, kind of one that's in there that they need, but uh, most of us have that. Housing, support for hotel rooms. A lot of times, they're going to ask for a little bit of a rebate off of those hotel rooms, um, and they look for a diverse mix of properties. Some will want uh, the economy hotels, mid-range hotels, you know, extended stay. Again, the client's going to know that, but you're like in any other convention or any other sporting event, you've got diverse audiences that make up those two, three, four, five thousand people that have diverse price points. So just understand that. And so if you're putting together a housing form, you may have four, five, six hotels out there with uh, a diverse price point and quality product mix. Then we get into uh, venue selection. Again, uh, the logistics of that appropriate venue for the event. Clients going to know right off the bat when we're touring them. They're going to look at it. They're going to know yes, this will fit. No, this won't. Um, and especially for that for that support uh, for their sport. And uh, and I think that's really important to, uh, for your destination. Again, is to know what venues you have to line them up. And then lastly, the key contact. Who is that one person who can make things happen? Who's the go-to person? Is it the sales manager within the sports commission? Is it the executive director? Who's the key contact that that person really has the juice to make things work, to turn everything on, to get things moving forward? So make sure that uh, you've got that key contact, that person who's got that enthusiasm, that drive, that desire, that determination to really work closely with the event organizer uh, to get everything done. And in your destination, Jim, that key contact is the person that you put in charge of the Sports Commission, correct? That would be correct. It's Dan Gallagher who's in charge of our Sports Commission, and he's our go-to person who has those relationships with the city, uh, with the venues, uh, with our hotel partners. Um, he's, he's our go-to guy for all of that. And I think the, the final point there is one that's true regardless of the type of group uh, a convention bureau is hosting. And that is working with the event organizer to provide an experience, not just an event that's being held in your city, but a way for the attendees to truly experience the destination. So thank you, Jim, for, for those insights. I just want to end with a couple other data points, the first being the connection between sports and leisure travel. Because as we mentioned earlier, there is a very strong connection. And if you take a look at this study provided by Destination Analysis Incorporated, you'll see that more than 90% of all leisure trips involve an organized sporting event or a participatory sports activity. So it's important to keep in mind, particularly if you're responsible for the sports market segment in your destination, 
that a lot of what gets classified as leisure trips to your destination may in fact be sports related trips. So it's important to think in those terms. I also like to send people away with these data points, courtesy of our friends at Visa, the credit card company, because I know so many people in the Convention Bureau world are focused on producing overnight stays, putting heads in bed. But if you take a look at what happens when a traveler visits your destination, the reality is that only a small percentage of the money they spend is for accommodation. In fact, it's only nine cents on the dollar, according to Visa. Take a look where the other pieces of that dollar go. 21% to activities, including entertainment and nightlife and other tourist attractions. 2% to beauty and wellness treatments and spa services. 24% to dining. And look how that's divided um, uh, between high-end restaurants and fast food restaurants and casual restaurants. Excellent division there in terms of spreading the wealth that's created by travelers coming to your destinations. And 30% of each dollar is spent at retail. And look again at the split there between medium and large retailers and small retailers. What you have is a message that everyone in the community needs to get behind. And that is the importance of the traveler coming to your city and spending that dollar because it gets spent in lots of ways that benefit everyone in the economy and not just the local hotel. We also like to talk a little bit about how to be sports friendly, and, and Jim went into that in his comments. We, uh, of course, encourage you to take a look at Sports Travel Magazine as a part of the mix for positioning your destination as sports friendly because Sports Travel Magazine reaches the gatekeepers to those 97.7 million room nights. And we do so by connecting destinations with all of these different types of sports organizations. In addition to Sports Travel Magazine, we highly encourage you and want to let you know that you're all invited to attend the Team 16 Conference and Expo September 26th through the 29th. It will be held in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So it will be a great opportunity for everyone in the travel industry to get a first-hand look at the things Jim Wood is doing in Atlantic City to reposition that destination. We invite you to attend, again, September 26th through the 29th. And there's more information, of course, available on our website. We're very proud to be DMAI premier partners at our company. And across all of our brands, we want everyone on the call to know that our company would not exist were it not for the support that we receive from destination marketing organizations. As many of you know, I'm very active in DMAI and the US Travel Association and the National Association of Sports Commissions. And I have always told all of our people we are a part of the travel industry. You may think we're a media company, but we're a part of the travel industry because we draw so much of our support from the travel industry. So I want to thank all of you uh, for that support and for being on this call today. If we can be of service in any way, that's what we're here to do. I would also encourage all of you to make plans to attend DMAI's annual meeting. The theme for this year's annual meeting will be a new playing field and that meeting will be held August 1st through the 4th in Minneapolis. So we'll look forward to seeing many of you there. Now, we have saved some time for questions. And Jim, Jim McCall, do you have any questions from today's viewers of the webinar? We do have a lot of questions coming in. I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions, you can submit them still through the question panel uh, on the GoTo dashboard. Uh, our first question is, and I'll give this over to Tim first. What is your experience and thoughts on regionalizing a sports commission? Well, if I understand the question correctly, uh, there is, I think, some benefits to be gained by joining efforts in a particular region. And we've seen a huge growth in the past you know, five to 10 years of statewide sports marketing initiatives. I think there's a benefit to doing that because uh, just as a convention bureau, we'll get a person interested in a particular destination and then determine which properties in that destination are right for that individual meeting planner. Uh, these sports marketing consortiums can do the same thing. They can get people interested in a state or a region of a state or a region of the country and then determine where the best fit exists. I do think it's important for cities and destinations to maintain their own unique selling proposition 
even if they're a part of a larger marketing co-op. And that gets back to the need to do destination-specific marketing, because every destination in the country has something unique to sell. They always need to get back to that as part of their marketing proposition. Jim, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, just a short answer. Yes, it makes sense. Uh, uh, Tim did a pretty good job answering the question. Re regionalism can save you money. Um, making sure that you, you don't have duplicity in staff. You've got to look at uh, you know, costs like that. If you've got a good team that can represent your region, it, it can work in some destinations. In some cities, you've got too much parochialism. It won't work yet um, because of politics. But if it can work, you should certainly try it. That's great. Uh, the next question is around incentives and uh, what you see as the role of incentives to attract um, sporting events to your destination, and if you see that landscape changing at all in the recent uh, past. And I'll give that over to Jim first. Yeah, we're, we see that all the time. I think everybody uh, in our world sees the, the need for incentives. Um, you just we, we use a formula, a mathematical formula, what we think an event is worth based on the overnight. Uh, we start there with the revenues from, from that, and again, we use a formula. Maybe we offer an incentive, 10%, 15%, 20%, also depends on the time of year of it. Um, and, and so we, we know that for some most sporting events, they need that extra little bit of cash because they're shipping in equipment. Uh, they've got extra staff to do things, so there's a need for that incentive for them to do it uh, because if their price point becomes so high, they lose attendees. And that's really what we want. Tim showed us a slide on where money is invested. So if we invest a little bit of money into that event with incentives that can help them drive attendance, we as a destination benefit greatly from that. And I would add to that that this issue of incentives and bid fees has become one that's uh, a, a bigger issue. And I can tell you that a part of that was the economic downturn of 2008 where a lot of sports organizations were forced with difficulty in finding sponsors for their events, so they ended up turning to the destinations that would benefit by hosting their event to try to make up for some of those losses in sponsorship dollars. But the reality is those costs have got to be kept in line with the value that's actually delivered to that host city. And yes. it's really incumbent upon the, the destination marketing organization to make sure that they're not going in too far uh, with, a, with an event that may or may not produce the results that the event organizer is claiming. So uh, certainly I think uh, you know every destination needs to be ready to be a part of that, but every destination also needs to be careful when doing that. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and you both briefly touched on this, um, but can you give some tips and maybe tools and resources that you would use um, in measuring the impact of a sporting event on your destination, uh, both prior and after the event? Yeah, well, one of the things that we do, obviously, we're, we will contact um, the previous year, two years, uh, cities that have hosted an event to get an understanding of, of really the, the traffic that came in. Obviously, we get that from the client, but we want to verify that. And, and then uh, the big value to us, of course, we know that with the overnight stay becomes the spend in the destination. So we really take a close look at that. Uh, some, a lot of sporting events, which we all have to be careful about, uh, drive nothing more than participants who drive in for the day and turn around and go home. And sometimes they ask for a lot of money for, for those types of events that may not provide the kind of economic impact that we're all searching for, for our destination. So it really is incumbent upon us to sometimes put, tie in our, our incentives that we're offering our clients into the room pickup and pay that incentive after the fact. And when I say after the fact, try never to give anybody a bid fee or an incentive before that event takes place. Tie it into a little bit of performance if you can and pay it within 30 days uh, after the event and be a, a good uh, CVB or sports commission and make sure you pay on time uh, to that client. But uh, I, would, I would urge people to think in that direction. This issue of economic impact has certainly become a hot button topic. And the more sophisticated event rights holders will oftentimes present 
economic impact data as part of their attempt to receive a bid fee or get incentives from a destination. I would encourage destinations to, uh, of course, review whatever information the event rights holder has. But uh, what we've seen in a lot of communities is cooperation between the DMO and the local university, particularly ones that have sports marketing and management programs, where they'll do relationships so that the university will actually conduct an economic impact study on behalf of the DMO so that they've got uh, more objective information to rely on. I think that's a, a, a suggestion I would make, particularly if you're looking at investing in an event that's going to return to your community uh, several times over the next several years. Having your own data, whether it's uh, information you collect from your local hotels on the room nights that were actually generated, trying to track it in whatever way you can becomes an important part of ensuring ROI from the hosting of sporting events. That, that is another great point. I think we have time for probably one last question, uh, but I think it's a great one and one that's probably very applicable to a lot of DMAI members. Do you have tips on how a small destination can compete with a nearby larger city in recruiting sports tournaments? Jim, I don't know. Have you had any experience in that regard? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How can a smaller how can a smaller destination compete against a larger destination? You know, it's it's service, service, service. It is getting to know uh, that right that rights holder of that sporting event, developing your relationships, good solid relationships, and making sure that you've got the right attributes that your destination has, uh, and you can provide a unique experience. But it really starts with relationship building. And, and getting to know the client. It also could mean go to that event the previous year if you're a small destination. Walk it and say, and, and introduce yourself to the client and, and just say, I'm here evaluating your entire sporting event uh, from, from soup to nuts. And uh, I'd like to get with you later on to show you how my city can, can perform for you in this way or better. That really, really um, can win over the heart of a, media, uh, of a sporting event planner. And then if they come to your city and you do have those right um, attributes that line up to what they need, uh, chances are you can be fairly successful in booking uh, additional business more than you think you can. That's excellent advice. And I think the only thing I would add to that is also don't eliminate the possibility of working with that other host city. If you're a smaller destination, establish a relationship with the bigger city that's in your area because they too are motivated by keeping people in their destination longer. And if you can figure out a way to do an ancillary event to the main event in your destination, that will not only drive visitation to your city, but will keep the people who are attending that sporting event in all of the area destinations longer, you'll have made a very popular move. And so I would encourage you also to network with all of the DMOs in your area that may be benefiting uh, from an event that's coming to town. Yeah, that is very good advice. Uh, well, we've run into our 3 o'clock hour. Tim and Jim, I just want to thank you both so much for taking the time to be with us today. I think it was a great, um, a lot of knowledge for our attendees. Um, if we didn't get to your question, don't worry. I will send those to our panelists so they can possibly follow up with you afterwards. And thank you, everyone, for joining. We look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, everyone.